Okay, we'll go ahead and get started really quick. Hi, my name is Nola Wanta. I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy at the LMU College of Business Administration. I'm just kicking us off to quickly talk about just general um, guidelines for our virtual event for today, hosted by our targeted affinity council for our finance area and the Young Alumni Committee. Um, so just a couple of notes. Um, if you have any questions, please do type them in the Q&A feature down below. Um, please reserve any um, comments that you may have on the chat. And also just a friendly reminder that this event is recorded. So, um, and, and the recording will be available to everyone later. So with that, I'd like to toss the ball over to Dean Dale Smith, who will welcome everyone. Dean Smith. Thanks, Nola. And in behalf of the College of Business Administration here at LMU, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our program today. I couldn't be more enthusiastic about our targeted affinity council, what we refer to as the TAC for, uh, for finance. We're fortunate to have a relatively new finance targeted affinity council being led by Ralph Birchmeyer, who is a 1991 alum of the CBA and a longtime volunteer on boards and is a guest speaker in many classes. In fact, I remember meeting Ralph at our stock competition and also in beautiful San Diego during my first year at LMU. And I'm so enthusiastic that he's jumped into a leadership role within our TAC. He is passionate on what we deliver to our students and to our alumni. And most recently, he helped Professor Spisman and Professor Tran develop the curriculum for a new finance elective, Equity Research and Capital Markets, Practical Applications of Bloomberg Terminals. Um, and just so you know, we used the Disaster Recovery Program that used to be just for uh, financial institutions. We were the first school in the country to say, well, why couldn't we do it here at LMU since all our students will be remote? So we were the first school in the country to do so and, and others have followed. So we're very fortunate to have those terminals due to the generosity of the many donors who support them. It's costly. And our Finance Learning Lab, which we hope will be up and running in the Hilton Lobby this next year when hopefully next fall we're all back. Ralph has spoken frequently in our finance courses. He has a tremendous background as a former investment manager and partner with Brandis Investment Partners in the San Diego area. The last thing I wanted to say is that the event is sponsored by our Finance Targeted Affinity Council's new Young Alumni Committee, designed to support young alumni as they consider their next steps a few years out of LMU. And I wanna thank everyone, and in particular, Jessica Purnell, class of 2018, for her hard work on this event. Jessica, by the way, uh, was on my search committee as a student representative. And I still recall when I was being interviewed as the Dean, she asked the toughest and most insightful questions during my interviews just three years ago. Anyway, I hope to have another event like this next semester. I know Jessica's open to your ideas, so definitely get them to her. And now without any further ado, over to you, Ralph. Thank you, Dale, so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here today and thank you all for filling in during your lunch hours. Really appreciate the opportunity to share some of the work that the FTAC is doing and then also to introduce a few of our prestigious alums. So the FTAC is supported by 30 alumni, volunteers, professors, and administrators who meet regularly. And we have a few goals. The first is to improve the finance curriculum that the current student body and future generations will take. The second is to provide career development opportunities for finance majors. And then most importantly for today's panel, uh, catalyzing young alumni engagement. So Jessica has already been introduced, but she heads the Young Alumni Committee. We've got a couple of uh, major purposes of that committee. The first is alumni connecting with alumni, really creating opportunities and interconnections that help uh, all of our finance alums prosper out in the real world. And then alumni, young alumni in particular, giving back to the LMU community, creating opportunities for classroom engagement, career shaping, and technical learning. <clears throat> so today's panel targets specifically pathways that are available to finance majors after graduation. So we're very pleased to have three distinguished alums here to talk about the paths that they took after graduation. And uh, there are disparate paths, obviously, to get to you know, your ultimate level of success. The first panelist, Jonathan Merhout, is an example of an alum who has worked his way up at the ranks at his existing firm. And he will be happy to tell you the ins and outs of navigating through that process. Eli Judy 
uh, has worked for the same company, yet returned in the middle to get her MBA to further propel her up the ranks. So it'd be great to get her insights. And finally, Kevin McConaughey has pivoted through several companies to get to his current outstanding level of success. So we're very excited to have all three of you here today sharing your wisdom and insights. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we'll do panelist introductions first, starting with Jonathan. I just wanna, again, just give a quick reminder. Uh, we would love some Q&A. So if anybody out there has questions that they would like to ask any one of the panelists or the panel in total, just uh, please drop them in the Q&A tab and then chats. Um, if you have any comments that you'd like to highlight to the group, you can feel free to drop those into the chat box. So with that, Jonathan, do you wanna maybe start with a little introduction about your background? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ralph. I wanna give a big thanks to uh, Jessica and the rest of the LMU team for spearheading this project um, and providing an avenue for young-ish alumni like myself to um, you know, give back and share our experience. Um, so as, as it relates to my path, um, so I'm a, a vice president at East Still Secured, um, and I can speak a little bit more about the company in a bit. Um, I graduated from LMU in, uh, in 2013 and studied finance and accounting in the business school. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Ellie, would you mind giving us a quick introduction? Sure, I echo Jonathan's thanks for having me. Um, my name is Ellie Chudy. I graduated from Loyola's MBA program in 2005. It's great to be virtually connecting with all of you. I work for the Capital Group, who as you probably know is an asset manager of the American Funds. Some people know it as Capital, some people know it as the American Funds. I've been with Capital 23 years. I joined out of undergrad and then as Ralph mentioned, um, went in staying employed and went back to school part-time, finishing in 05. I'm currently a senior manager, managing a team called the Fundamental Research Group. It is probably pretty obvious from the name what the team does. Um, we work with portfolio managers and investment analysts at Capital, really supporting their fundamental research efforts. The team I manage is global in the US, Europe, and throughout Asia, and we focus in equities and fixed income. Thank you, Ellie, appreciate it. Uh, Kevin, if you'd like to offer an introduction. You bet, thanks. Thanks, Ralph, and thanks everyone. Like I said, uh, this is a great opportunity and great event that you guys are putting on, so really appreciate the opportunity here. Um, just for me, I'm Kevin McConaughey. Um, I graduated from the MBA program in 2005, and um, as uh, and currently, I'm over at Yamaha Financial Services. We're the captive finance company for Yamaha Motors, who you know, wave runners, sport boats, uh, motorcycles, et cetera. We, we help finance those. Um, previous to that, I came from Toyota Financial Services, so background there. And, and really, you know, I'm, I'm just really excited to be here today to talk about, um, you know, for me, I was in your shoes many, many years ago. Um, and so just be, having an opportunity to hear about how people kind of move through their careers that, you know, I just really wanted to give an opportunity to, to maybe uh, provide some insight and hopefully, uh, create a nice engaging discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, so what we'll do is start by turning this over to Jonathan. It would be a fantastic help if you could kind of walk us through where you started after your graduation and the steps, you know, some of the major steps you've taken to get to the position of success that you've experienced today. And if uh, you can think of any kind of advice or pitfalls along along the line that, uh, you know, um, maybe others in future generations can overcome by knowing a little bit about it, that would be a huge help as well. And then what I thought we would do after Jonathan offers those thoughts is open it up to the panel and let all of us together, you know, really just uh, ask him any questions that might help uh, all of the attendees today in terms of uh, considering that as one potential pathway as they evolve from their current career that is staying at their existing company and working their way up through the ranks. Jonathan, please. Great, thanks again, Ralph. Um, so the, I think the reason why I'm on this panel is when you look at kind of my career to date, graduating in 2013, it's been, it's been fairly linear, um, especially from the perspective of, of a millennial like myself. There's not much 
you know, loyalty, I would say in the career place. And, you know, a lot of my peers and friends have, have bounced around, you know, a number of companies and, you know, there's really no right or wrong approach. It works different for, for a lot of folks, but I mean, my, my career has been very linear. I've been at the same company for, you know, six years um, so far. And um, I started as an analyst, um, you know, right out of, out of school and, um, my experience in the business school really helped prepare me um, for some of the work and, you know, the long hours that I worked, you know, as an analyst. And so I, I worked with people, really numbers, um, you know, being behind the scenes, you know, providing support for, you know, the deal teams that are executing, you know, business, um, you know, selling large real estate portfolios or, you know, public markets business as well. So providing support for for those folks uh, in a very close knit team environment with, you know, my peers who are my age and, you know, following that um, and working, you know, tremendously long hours, sipping a lot of coffee, um, you know, making a lot of sacrifices, not necessarily, you know, hanging out with my friends on the weekends or, you know, midweek. Um, I really dedicated myself, you know, to this career because I found it, I found it personally rewarding and it was a challenge and I was never bored. And so, you know, with that, I was able to find a group within the company that, you know, I thought played to my strengths um, as an individual. And it was also a, a new group. And so for me, that was very enticing. And that provided, you know, a very rewarding experience because I wasn't necessarily, you know, punching my ticket in line, so to speak, and just waiting to progress through my career at this firm, but I was joining a small team that provided a very succinct growth path for myself, where I would be shown opportunities and put in roles where, you know, I may not have seen that on a larger, more built out team. So for me, I chose a more entrepreneurial, um, you know, less proven route within a company. And through that, I was able to progress you know, frankly, much faster than my peers were. Um, and, you know, eventually I was promoted to vice president, you know, about two years ago. And so um, how that role works now is I'm more client facing, you know, I now have analysts and associates, you know, below me that are, you know, helping to support the analytics, the number crunching, the book work, um, you know, much of which I'm still doing myself. Um, but it was that exact opportunity to, you know, kind of take a risk on a newer group um, and through that, I was given more responsibility and was able to grow into my current role. And so I um, want to leave all the listeners with, with a few things. And these have kind of been critical um, for me personally in, in getting to where I am today. And, you know, I, of course, have, have so much, you know, further growth that I'm expecting and, and hoping to achieve at this company. But um, I think three important factors are you know, one, really choosing something that you find personally rewarding, um, you know, whether that's at your firm, at another firm, um, a different role within your firm. I think this is critical to doing your best work. And the reality is, if you're bored and don't find what you're doing rewarding, you're not going to be the best at it. And not saying I'm the best at anything, but the fact that I enjoy what I do and, you know, find it extremely challenging and, you um, you know, for that, that for me makes it rewarding and I'm never bored. And so another thing is never be satisfied with your current role and having kind of an innate curiosity about other things that you can accomplish or roles that you can fill that may not necessarily be within your purview. You know, I think that's really critical to getting promoted and moving up within a company and organization or really achieving success anywhere. And, um, you know, it, it's not just checking all the boxes for your current role, but it's, it's trying to be helpful and taking on new responsibilities for things that, you know, may not necessarily be your job. And so I, I think the last thing, and this plays a little bit into, you know, politics, into the workforce. And I mean, the, the reality is you need to form relationships within your company and your organization. And so I think it's absolutely critical to find a mentor within your company. It can be someone on your team. It can be someone outside of your team, but 
hopefully they have some sort of influence at a senior level. And it's important to, you know, to hitch your trailer to them, quote unquote, because when you're entering a firm as an analyst or as an associate, as you know, a fresh faced, just out of college kid, you're, you're not going to have much access in most companies to the senior leadership of the firm. So it's really important that you're able to cultivate some sort of relationship with someone senior. And, you know, through that, they can, you know, have your back and, and speak about you in a, in a very positive light, where otherwise you may not have that exposure to, you know, senior members of the firm. And so I think between, you know, those three things, um, you know, I've found a relative level of, of success at my firm and, you know, continue to be happy in what I'm doing and, you know, try and get better every day and continue growing and, you know, having a great time while doing it. Uh, Jonathan, so many points there that are worth following up on. I've got lots of questions, but maybe at this point, if uh, you, you all don't mind me turning it over to the panelists and maybe somebody else has a question they'd like to ask Jonathan. Or uh, uh, we could do from the Q&A as well. Um, I think maybe the Q&A uh, from the attendees will, will fo focus more toward the tail end of the presentation. Yeah, Rob, um, I, Ellie or Kevin? Yeah, I'd love to jump in and just add to what Jonathan mentioned. Um, really to kind of grow and change, I agree, you have to be willing to say yes to new opportunities. And I'm gonna speak more from the lens of you know, I manage an 80 plus team, a capital of highly talented people. And I'm honestly sometimes surprised when we ask them to take on new things that they say no. And it's always an amazingly thoughtful no. Um, but when I look around and I see successful people, they are people who say yes more than they say no. Whether it's an investment person who was asked to get involved in our ESG efforts, on extreme, maybe it's a trader from the US who they want to go to Hong Kong and be on the Hong Kong trading desk for three years. Um, when someone asks you to do something, it's really because they've thought about you and think you can be successful. And so this concept of the thoughtful no, sometimes it's a time commitment thing, but honestly in managing a lot of different people for many years, you know, I tied a little bit to this narrow view they view their work and they view their path in a very narrow sense. And so I encourage you, get out of your comfort zone. Say yes to work that you're not exactly sure how it's going to benefit you. And you might not even like the work that much, but I would encourage you, get involved and do it. Because at the minimum, it will expand your perspectives. It will expand your relationships. Like Jonathan mentioned, those relationships are, are very important. And it will lead potentially to new opportunity or a broader network of people. And, and for some, it might even lead to a pivot. Um, which might be better suited for more future success. So I just, I would encourage you to, to say yes to new opportunities. I think that's such a great point. I, I, I totally agree. And um, we, we have a less edifying way to describe that at my firm. And we say there is value to jumping on grenades and people, uh, people give you credit <laughs> for it, <laughs> for taking the tough opportunities. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll interject as well from my perspective. Um, uh, I think, uh, Jonathan, you hit on a, a, a really unique or good word that I like to use, uh, curiosity, and, and I'll expound on that intellectual curiosity. It is something that every time I'm interviewing um, uh, for, for a new role, I want to see that being demonstrated or show some effort of it being developed because it tells me that there's no question left unturned for you. And so it really means you'll go above and beyond. And, and so, and you can spot it very quickly usually. And so those people who demonstrate it, uh, it's extremely important and, and just a very uh, strong attribute that we really value. Um, the other piece, and, and Ellie and Jonathan touched on it, was this idea of uh, relationships. And and I, I kind of characterize relationships in two ways, right? You have your formal formal relationships and formal networks and you have your informal networks. And, um, you know, and, and sometimes it's those informal networks that'll really uh, make a big difference in your career and the impact it can have. One, one thing I used to do when I was at a previous role, when I was at Toyota, and it's harder to do during COVID, so I'm thinking of how, a good analogy on how to think about it, but I would get up and walk the building. You know, I would go visit my business partners. I wouldn't rely on <laughs> being on the phone or, and again, it's a little more challenging now, but 
you know, an instant message versus a voice or versus a uh, versus a video chat is going to be a lot um, less, um, I think, engaging than, than seeing someone on a video. So if, if you kind of relate it to current terms, getting up, getting out, out of your desk or cube or your office and seeing someone face to face is really uh, has a huge impact. It's even managing teams. It's really hard for me to see how that person's thinking or feeling just through an instant message or an email. So getting up, engaging, because uh, those networks, those formal, informal networks are so valuable. Kevin, thanks so much, um, all three of you. Those are really great insights. Uh, Ellie, if you don't mind, I will turn to you at this point. Uh, Capital Group, as many of us know, is a very large global institution. Could you talk about how you've navigated your way through the Capital Group since you arrived there? And then also, maybe if you could offer a, a little bit of insight about uh, why and when you chose to pursue your MBA? Sure, sure. So let me kind of start with the why going back to school. There's actually kind of a couple of personal reasons and definitely a large professional reason. Kind of starting more on the personal side, those people who know me, I love learning. I love the academic setting. I've always loved being a student. And well before I knew what the content would be, um, I remember sitting at my sister's graduation. She has her master's in education. And I was like, you know, I want a master's degree. I didn't know what the content was going to be, but that was definitely, I wanted education beyond my undergrad degree. Um, also on a personal level, years ago, um, I was recently married. I was thinking, we were thinking about starting a family. Um, I thought there might be a chance I leave the workforce. Actually, I am one of four kids, I have a family of, with four kids. So I had, as part of a big family, I thought I would want a big family. And so going back to school was also a little bit of, you know, a re-entry if I left. Having that MBA I thought would be helpful. Um, and then I ended up not leaving, I, I stayed at Capital. Um, but professionally, I was about five years post undergrad. I had done two years in a rotational program at Capital. I'd spent three years as a research associate working with our analysts who covered the auto industry and then the food and beverage companies. Um, and then I moved from being player to kind of coach, moving from a research associate into managing the research associates. And if you take a minute, walk, I want you to like walk back with me um, in time, because for me, here I was um, in my late 20s, married, thinking about a family, spent three years working really hard um, for these analysts and getting a really an up close kind of front seat ticket to how capital does amazing fundamental research. I had done two levels of my CFA um, and I've seen this investment path you know, evolving in front of me. And then the ask came, honestly, uh, the research directors called me in and they're like, hey, we think you could be a great manager of this growing global team. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> it's a huge pivot. Um, so I, I thought about it um, and I said, yes. And so I stopped the CFA um, and that's when I went to Loyola to get my MBA because as a people manager, I wanted a broader exposure. Um, get the CFA, you know, it's great for the technical. I love hiring people that have their CFA. Um, but as I was moving into a people manager role, I thought going back and getting my MBA would just kind of balance out the technical piece of my education. Um, and you know, I, I can't say it was required to grow at Capital. Um, you know, I, I was in the manager role before I went back to school. So it depends on how you define growth. If it's a title promotion, it, it wasn't needed for me at Capital, but truly the, the people I met, the professors, the coursework, it broadened my perspective and I think enabled a lot of just deeper growth um, in myself. Um, and where, you know, it helped me in my career, it was a lot of ways, but I'm, I'm gonna take all of you to this very specific moment. Um, so I walked into the org behavior class that I was taking that semester and there was a quote written on the board and I'm sitting in my, my chair and I write it down and I start thinking about it. And the quote, again, it was an org behavior class. It was all about people managing change through organizations. Um, again, I wrote this quote down and I ended up sticking it next to my, my desk at work. And I, as I thought about it, I was like, wow, there's so much kind of truth to um, what this professor had put on the board. And 
the quote was, you know, people will never remember what you said. They will never remember what you did, but they will always remember the way you made them feel. And so I tried it. I said, hmm. So I thought back to a disagreement I had with my sister years ago, and I'm like, I was so mad. I remember feeling that, but I could not remember the context of the argument, and I couldn't remember what we said to each other. And that it's true on the positive side. Like, I think back to a, a big game we won years ago. I can't really remember the team or the score, but man, I remember it felt really good. Um, and so it, I share this example because it's a class that really made me a better manager. And clearly I still think about it today. And when I'm having maybe difficult conversations with associates I manage, I, I check myself and I really go to this place of how am I making this person feel? And I might in the moment kind of pivot what I'm saying or the approach a little bit. Um, and again, it works on the positive. I do it too with recognition. We, we all get really busy, um, but at the end of the day, if someone on my team has done something, I, I try and recognize them with a note because they'll remember that. You know, years from now, they won't remember exactly what the content of the work probably was, but they remember these, these feelings. Um, and so really in big ways and small ways, this concept that that class was kind of teaching around, and again, it was more around managing people through change and, um, but it was a huge takeaway to think about in a manager role how you make people feel and it kind of it relates to being an empathetic leader but if you really kind of break it down it will make you just a better associate a better team member a better manager maybe eventually a better leader and so i really think having my mba and doing that kind of mid-career really helped in that next chapter in my journey at capital which is more in kind of the the managing and now leading a team of people uh, that's fantastic thank you so much uh, jonathan or kevin anything to add along the lines of what ellie was talking about yeah i, I have kind of a question for you ellie um, so being, being a manager at your level, and this is something that, you know, I've kind of been dealing with, um, I wouldn't consider myself a manager, but I do oversee, you know, 20 or so analysts and, you know, a few, a few associates, well, not, not associates anymore, unfortunately. Um, but how do you balance, you know, personal relationships inside of the office, um, you know, with your role as a manager, potentially overseeing their work and, you know, allocating, their work as well. Um, how do you balance, you know, a relationship with, um, you know, providing oversight, you know, being their boss effectively? Yeah, you know, I always start with the lens of being their manager. You know, it's, um, and you want to be their friend too, but um, yeah, but it's, it's, I always have that lens on, even in kind of more of those social situations. I tend to be very kind of conservative on that side, though. Um, my husband's probably a little more kind of casual with some of those relationships. Um, but it can be hard. But I think when you manage someone, it's about trust. And it's about understanding their comfort. So when I travel to different offices, like some people are really comfortable with a hug and others it's a handshake. And so I think it's just knowing your team where they're comfortable and meeting them in their space and not assuming because you're, I, I'm a, a hugger, I, I like people, but not everyone I manage is like that. And so I really try and get to know someone first and kind of know where they are and I meet them in their space. Um, and, and those relationships might be a little bit different, um, but I hope over time, like everyone feels that I'm their advocate and I will treat all of them um, and you know, just advocate for them um, as we're thinking about their growth and their development. But it can be a tricky, a tricky balance, um, but I definitely kind of lean a little bit more on kind of first and foremost, I'm gonna manage them, develop them, help them establish trust. Um, and yeah. Good insight, thanks. There was an, uh, oh, sorry, Kevin, why don't you go first? Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, I was just gonna expound upon, I, I too kind of mid-career went back to get my MBA as well and in very similar situation. Um, and, and it wasn't um, in the sense like going back, I needed to develop or work on some things personally and, and professionally. But for me, it was really, I had always been in these technical, very technical finance roles. And 
you know, when you go back to school, sometimes you get pigeonholed into some of those roles uh, again, over and over again, you're always the finance guy. Uh, but you know, the MBA gave me a great opportunity to kind of wear some different hats. At the end of the day, I came out of it, you know, it's still being the technical guy, but now, you know, you, you, you have, um, and, and kind of eventually working up through the leadership chain, but, um, but having that experience um, allows you to, uh, to wear different hats throughout your career. And, you know, potentially, uh, to Ellie's point, it, it can diversify your potential opportunities. And maybe, you know, eventually you can possibly pivot into maybe something that's a little bit different. But because you do manage people and you've been successful at it, uh, you, you, can, um, you can move to something that's, that may be out of your normal uh, purview. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we'll move to you in a minute. Um, Ellie, while we have you kind of as that primary point of focus, uh, a question did come up from one of the attendees, liked by a few people, on uh, any tips uh, related to glass ceiling uh, for women, people of color, um, any advice you could offer? I don't know, I mean, if you've had any experiences like that that you would care to share, just um, anything that might be helpful to the attendees? Yeah, speak up. When you experience that, don't be quiet, you know, and I think we are not there yet, but the environment is becoming more open. We just did these great sessions on microaggressions um, with our team because DNI is obviously an enormous focus for us. Um, um, so I just don't go quietly, you know, just um, break through those ceilings. And if you're feeling like you didn't get an opportunity that you should have, like understand it. Hold those people who made the decisions accountable and if they can't give you a good reason, keep asking. Um, so I would just encourage you, yeah, to just be an advocate for yourself and bring in others along and those mentors and, and talk to people. Um, yeah, and, and don't be you know, afraid to, um, to make mistakes and to, to push through those. Um, we had Carla Harris who spoke to a bunch of capital associates yesterday and it was interesting to hear her path in the investment world and she made a huge mistake on like a naked short <laughs> early on her career and her manager is kind of bullying her and she pulled him aside and said look this doesn't define me I made a mistake can it be over you know so that self-advocacy and having confidence so here this person she was early in her career she had the confidence to be like you know what, this is how you're making me feel. Can this just be over? And so I would just encourage you, if you're feeling it, experiencing it, if you can't talk to your manager, talk to someone else, um, but, but don't be quiet because everyone needs to learn and grow and we have to point these things out or it will not get better. Thank you so much, Ellie. That's really great advice. Kevin, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to you. Uh, you've worked at a number of really fantastic corporations, and it would be so interesting to hear your journey from your first position that you took out of school along the path to that high level of success that you've achieved today. Uh, any wisdom is appreciated. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, if you, if you look at my, uh, the list of companies who I've worked for, you can tell uh, I might be a little risk averse. <laughs> I like big, big companies, <laughs> um, but it's really important to find big, big companies who you uh, associate your values with, a place where, uh, you know, using some of Jonathan's words, you know, you, you find personally rewarding because that's going to pay off um, working for a company or leadership or managers who, who don't share the same values or you don't align with the vision and the mission of the company, as well as the leaders, you're, you're, you're just going to end up being uh, dissatisfied and, and and really uh, challenged in your career, if, if, if that's um, kind of the view. But, um, but, you know, for me, you know, first, first out of school, I started, you know, kind of more in an accounting uh, view as an auditor at, at Chevron and eventually moved to Mattel Toys. Um, and then at some point, you know, at, at, while at Mattel, I was getting my MBA. Um, and actually while at Mattel, um, when I would go to school at night at 7 p.m., that was actually the earliest I would usually get off. I was working a lot of hours in a, it's a great organization, but at the time we were going through a lot and it was just really challenging to be uh, handedly at that time in finance for that company. And so I just really was thinking about my career and where I wanna be and some of the things I wanna do. And I had some friends who worked over at 
Toyota. And I thought I had, I heard some great, you know, things about it. I, you know, great company, great product. And, um, and I just felt at that point, I was maybe just in need of a change, uh, a pivot, you know, and, and I, I moved to a financial services company. So prior to moving to Toyota Financial Services, um, I had been in more consumer packaged goods, oil and gas, you know, much more traditional industries, and was moving to an automotive company where I said to myself, eh, financial services, I'm going to spend there, I'm going to spend a year or two there. And I'm going to go over to the automotive side because that's way more attractive to me. You know, like, oh, it's, it's a lot more interesting. But along the way, you know, my first year or two at Toyota in the financial services company, I really learned that, you know, I really, uh, the, the content and the, the challenges of the job, um, you know, having more of that um, financial services background was really what I would call nutrient rich content that as a finance professional, I really, really um, enjoyed working through much more than maybe a traditional business model. And so for me, it was a way, um, like I said, at first I thought I'd move to more of a traditional sales company eventually, but really along the way I, I learned, you know, I really had a knack for this and it was particularly interesting for me, very challenging, uh, you know, work-wise, but also very fulfilling. And so um, I was able to, while I was there, you know, uh, progress along in my career and eventually um, was able to move to much more of a leadership role at Yamaha Financial Services. Again, uh, motorsports, automotive, but still the captive finance company. And, and so from a, a professional perspective, uh, the challenge of the content of the role and um, the types of things we work through and work on uh, has been particularly rewarding. And I guess my, my, um, my lesson there was don't necessarily, um, you know, pick a particular business model and just kind of that's, that's it. I think what I found in my career is uh, you can do, you can have these types of roles at multiple, you know, different types of companies. You know, now I do financial planning, uh, you know, budgeting, planning, et cetera. I can take that role and skill set to any particular business model. So whether it's back to captive, uh, you know, captive finance, whether it's consumer packaged goods, whether it's oil and gas, uh, you, you diversify your opportunities. So whether it's going back to school or diversifying the experiences you've had, um, that has been my experience. It's, you know, everybody has their own, but for me, it's been diversifying those experiences to actually open up the potential for more roles down the road. And, and you know, for me now, I just kind of more look like, hmm, maybe, maybe I'd want to go into a different industry. Well, having some of that experience as well as the confidence to maybe move across industries could, could you know, make me think maybe, maybe it's something uh, closer to home. Maybe it's something totally different, you know, but, it, 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 it opens up those opportunities, I guess, is my point. Uh, Ellie, Jonathan, anything you'd like to add on top of what Kevin's already told us? Yeah, I, I have a question for Kevin, um, just about your MBA. So when you decided to pursue your MBA, and Ellie, you can probably opine on this as well. Um, did you have a very targeted view of what you wanted to do after and what you were trying to accomplish by getting your MBA? Or was it more so, you know, I'm going to go back to school for a couple of years and then see what opportunities that brings? You know, for, for me, it was, I, I, I really wanted to get, you know, much broader base um, under, under me in terms of my expertise and understanding. I, I felt it also was going to help me round myself out for a leadership role eventually. I felt like the group work, um, different types of, you know, um, working through different uh, content, and, and then also the group work was gonna be very helpful for me, just in terms of how I interacted with others. Uh, I, I really felt like I needed it at that point. Um, but for me, I, I kind of knew I wanted to continue in finance, it's just, it was gonna help me develop. So I really, it was kind of my personal development plan and, and it, it, it meant, going back and, and getting that MBA. 
Yeah, and for me, you know, I was already in the manager role, but it was just acknowledging, and again, I, that's why I, I switched from the CFA program to the MBA to really broaden out who I was, gain perspective. I took some investment classes, but um, that's when I took core behavior, HR. I took these other types of courses that I thought would help prepare me um, to, to managing people and think about things differently. And that one class on change management, um, I've led my team through a lot of change. And so it was hugely valuable to just to have the, the academic, even the notes, right, to go back to how do you guide teams or organizations through change. And so these things were really, really critical as I was moving into a manager role and then a leader role where you're expected to not just manage people, but um, drive the business and set the tone and lead th people through change. And so um, I went back to do a little bit of the finance piece, but again, I was already stepping into the manager role. So I focused in some of these other courses that were hugely helpful. Thank you three so much. We're starting to get an increasing list of questions in the Q&A tab. By the way, if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A tab and comments in the chat. Um, there's a great question that came up from somebody uh, asking, how do you ensure that you don't become too comfortable in your roles? And how do you know when it's time to look for new opportunities? Presumably, I don't know if internal or external or both, but we would love your thoughts um, if you have any, um, any insights for our attendees. Thank you. I'm happy to take that one um, first. And so I think it's a, it's a really good question um, because I think after you've been working at a firm for a number of years, you know, as, as I have, you know, pretty much my whole career, you eventually get to a certain level of, of comfortability. And when you're feeling comfortable, in my view, you stop growing. And so you really have to make it a point to look yourself in the mirror, um, you know, to look around your firm, look at, you know, senior folks, look at people outside your firm and, you know, have curiosity, you know, try to emulate what, what other folks are doing, get uncomfortable, you know, in my case, I'm in a very transitional role right now where for the first, you know, five, six years of my career, I was spending most of my time in the office. Well, the way that I'm going to advance my career is to start bringing business in the door. And, you know, I'm 29 years old. And in many cases, the folks that I'm talking to have their MBAs, you know, they've been in the business for a long time. And, you know, I don't necessarily disclose my age, you know, I, I take meetings where, you know, I'm not comfortable. And, you know, as an example, yesterday, I, you know, drove up to Santa Barbara, you know, met with a owner of, you know, 80 student housing properties in that market um, to help advise him on what his strategy should be, you know, next year for when he eventually wants to sell. And, you know, frankly, that made me uncomfortable, <laughs> um, you know. The, what was I going to have to navigate in that meeting? Um, you know, what questions was he going to ask? You know, do I have enough experience to handle all those questions? And, you know, I think it went really well. And so I think the point that taken from all this is put yourself in these situations that aren't comfortable for you and you're going to grow from it and you keep doing that every day. And, you know, eventually you're going to, you know, gain more experience. And when you look back, you know, a year, two years, three years, you're going to be amazed by how far you've come. Add, um, it's okay to take your time because at different times in your career, you're going to be a different type of contributor and that's okay. And, and what I mean by that is at some points you're going to be on that promotional path and you're going to be pushing towards that next step. And then other times you're going to be developing yourself laterally and they're both equally important. And so um, I would encourage you to in those times when you're feeling a little more comfortable, push lateral, like push where you are, get involved in that project. And then you figure out how that then leads to maybe that promotion, if that's something that you want. We've got all types of contributors. I have some who are gonna be life research associates and they do a phenomenal job. 
and they're great in their role. They're challenged by the content of the work and they like what they're doing. And then I have others who we are actively developing to potentially be leaders. And so it's being honest with what type of contributor you are. And keep in mind, there's a life overlay, right? Some people come in, they want to be more on that promotional path. And then something happens, right? Maybe they um, have a sick parent, or maybe they want to be more involved in the nonprofit sector and, and balance things with their work. So it's just, I encourage you, know what kind of contributor you are, and it's okay to be growing laterally. Um, and it's okay then to sometimes be pushing for that next promotion because um, your career is very, very long and there's value in both of those. And it's exhausting if you think you're going to be on this enormous <laughs> um, promotional path for the existence of your career, you will be exhausted um, well before you probably get to where you are. So I would just, it is a marathon, not a sprint. I would engage in everything that you're doing. Um, and if you're feeling a little bit, and, and I'd say there's a difference between being complacent in your role and being comfortable, because sometimes actually you need comfort for a handful of years, depending on what else you might be going through or dealing with or, or other interests that in that moment might be more important to you um, than kind of pushing on that promotional path. So. Um, yeah, so I just encourage you, sometimes it's okay to slow it down and just really absorb from everyone's around you, even because you're always growing. It's either lateral growth or it's promotional growth. And those are both lovely when you think about a 60 year plus career. You're on mute. <laughs> All right, Kevin, would you like to jump in with any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I think I'll just, uh, those are great points, Ellie. Uh, and I think just to add on to that quickly is just um, that taking that lateral or exploring a lateral versus promotion, uh, I, I kind of mentioned it, it diversifies your promotional opportunities. So <laughs> if, you, if you lateral into another group, well, potentially you could actually move up there. And actually what happened to me when I was at Toyota Financial Services, I moved into another group, risk management, which was maybe a little bit more technical than the finance side. And then I came back to finance because they valued that expert, expert experience. And so I came back and was promoted back into finance. So I left finance for a little bit and then got promoted back into it. Now I'm on that path still, but um, it, it really, it, 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 like I said, it diversifies the opportunities. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing this risk averse side of you now, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, continuing education is, is so important. I mean, that's a, a big theme from what all three of you are talking about. And there's a number of questions that have come in about how do you keep yourself sharp and when do you make the determination to uh, uh, get an MBA or, you know, there's um, and, and for outside knowledge gaining, there's there's the more formal channels like an MBA or a CFA, Ellie, you mentioned, you started to work on that. There's a lot of informal ways. You can read books, you can, uh, um, uh, you, know, you can take online classes. I mean, there's, you, know, you can just talk to people, you can uh, um, attempt to network in an industry that you don't know a lot about, um, join professional groups. Um, any, any thoughts that the three of you have on continuing education um, obviously, the way to progress in a career is to continue to make yourself more and more valuable. Yeah, it's a good, there are a lot of avenues. Um, and it's just, I think you have to be true to who you are. Um, for the team that I manage, some are very nervous test takers. And so the CFA is going to be a painful three years, and it's one day, and if they're super nervous, they might mess it up, and then now it's a four- or five-year process for them. And so it's, I think it's understanding where you um, excel as a learner. And so for some people sitting in class and um, having a semester, and then they know at the end of the semester they get grades that lead to an MBA, like, like for me, I like that, right? I, I tend to, like 
and I do, I, I do the class, I get the grade, I'm one step closer. The CFA was very nerve wracking for me. It's all this studying and I'm driving that morning an hour to the test site and I want to get there an hour early. You know, so I tend to be a little bit more nervous on that kind of show up on a day and do this enormous test. And um, so you just kind of go where you know you're going to be happy in which environment. I, I was actually thrilled and I'm like, okay, I don't have to do CFA level three. What a relief. I was so excited to jump into the MBA path. And when I started, I was kind of like, wow, I probably, sh I should have just done this from the beginning because it was just such a more pleasant experience for me. Um, and then I would say, um, you know, look around you. Like my team right now, um, you know, investment research, we're doing a lot with artificial intelligence. We're doing a lot with machine learning. Um, I have people on my team who we call it kind of upskilling. We're putting them in classes with Python and we just did a Python info session. And you better believe I was like, who on my team went? You know, <laughs> we said it's open to everyone, but I, I definitely got the attendance list because clearly they went because they might be interested. Um, so there's ways to kind of upskill yourself, but to do that, you want to be aware. Um, I have an associate in our Geneva office. He's doing an ESG certification. These are new certification programs. Great. A huge area that is not going away. Um, it's, it's definitely more developed in Europe, but the U.S. were on it too. So it's if that's a neat program that he's getting a certification on. So I think there's the formal channels for the those letters, the MBA, the CFA, the CPA, you know, there's that path. And then there's different certifications you can think about that make you relevant in the current time, whether it's like ESG or um, getting a Python, you know, one year certificate from a you know. So that's kind of, so there's the upskilling piece and then there's kind of that more formal um, so it just kind of depends on where you are and talk to people. If you can't figure it out, um, I tell my team all the time, like, who is your personal board of directors? Companies have them. And so I'd encourage you. And, and what that is, it's kind of a fun play on who are your mentors. And that personal board of directors should be obviously people who support you and understand you. Someone maybe who is like-minded, but then you need at least two people who process the world exactly to your opposite. And, you, and, and folks like that can just kind of help you think about your career in different ways and even these degrees in different ways. But I think it's really important as Kevin and Jonathan have both mentioned mentors, but I would almost go a step further in kind of this personal board of directors because it's people, um, we gravitate to people who are mentors, but you need to find those people who are, who are more your opposite because they will make you better in your thought process as you're thinking through these things. I like that personal board of directors. I'm going to use that. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there uh, is one question that uh, a few people liked about um, COVID, and just um, any quick thoughts on whether or how much COVID has impacted your career progression or the way you do your job. Um, and then we have a few minutes left um, for maybe one other question after that. Thank you. I, I can start with that one and I'll, I'll keep it relatively brief since we're coming up on, on one. Um, but I think short answer, absolutely. You know, it's, it's been a huge impact to, you know, my career, my firm. Um, and I think most of the world falls in that bucket and it's, it's very easy to, you know, get discouraged, um, you know, about all the time spent indoors, you know, the seven to eight months working in your, kitchen like I have in my one bedroom apartment in, in Santa Monica. Um, but at the same time, you know, this is a crisis that the world's going through and you just have to keep a positive spin on it. And it's, it's affecting everyone in different ways. So um, it's, I think it's very important to take it with a grain of salt, keep your chin up and understand that, you know, you have to have faith in the human race and in science and we're gonna get through this very quickly. Um, and tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. Yeah, Capital's put together a sustainability group around what practices will be sustained post-COVID that are different from pre-COVID. So it's this interesting body of work. Um, for years, Capital was like, the service centers can never be remote. They went remote in seven days. I mean, it was this phenomenal effort. Because keep in mind, there's hundreds of millions of people who own American funds, and they call call centers. 
And again, we never thought that that could be remote and it, <laughs> it went in seven days, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, I love that people are, are comfortable on video. I, I mentioned I managed a global team and so I traveled a lot, but I see them weekly now on video, which is fantastic. And they, I hope that's something that we will, and I think we will maintain even when we get back into the office. Um, it was interesting. The investment group used to want their research support in their local office. That is just been blown out of the water. We have work being done. I have work from San Francisco folks being done in New York or in Singapore. Like, so this, this concept of doing work remote is, in capitals maybe a little slower to kind of be comfortable with that, but we are, it's amazing how much more comfortable we are with just kind of people working from different places. And just, I think in a good way, working from home. Capital was a little behind the curve, I think, on comfort with our associates. We were just launching a work from home program before COVID, when a lot of companies have been doing that for a long time. And so there's just going to be enormous flexibility um, when we get back into the workplace, which I think is good. I think it's good for people to have a little more flexibility, um, being able to be at home and not having it feel taboo in any way. So yeah, I mean, I think COVID um, it has been hard, and uh, Jonathan mentioned, but I think there will be some good and sustained changes in business practices. Evan, any quick thoughts to offer on COVID? You know, really, it's just, um, for, for me, it's been even myself being impacted by being at home uh, and also managing teams from home. And, and really, um, it's forced me to reach out and be more engaged with my team. Uh, it, it kind of forces you to sharpen the pencil as a manager because engagement is so important, um, making sure we're aligned, uh, goals, uh, et cetera. And so it's really forced me a lot and, and forced me and my team and I to really become a, a, a much stronger team, I would say. So it's, it's really forced the issue on some things. And, and like Ellie said, uh, we, we We've also a company who wasn't necessarily open to a lot of work from home. Uh, we turned it around in like three, four days. It was unbelievable what was done. Uh, and, and kind of the, you kind of, um, you underestimate <laughs> what that can do. And, and, and so now we're looking at stuff we, we never would have looked at. You know, we're a much more traditional company. Uh, they did not like people working from home. So uh, we've, we've changed, we've changed that view. So. It's uh, really interesting, so. Uh, thank you so much, panelists, for all of your insights today. We learned a lot. Um, if I can just recap a little bit, I've been uh, taking notes on some of the nuggets of wisdom. So Jonathan, you talked about the importance of finding a mentor, never being satisfied with your current role, uh, seek advancement, and force yourself to get out of your comfort zone a little bit, get uncomfortable. Ellie, uh, you talked about the importance of um, not being afraid to take on new challenges. Say yes. Uh, empathy, I like that point a lot. Empathy is an important part of the journey to your coworkers, to your superiors, to the folks who report to you. Uh, and then that, um, that quote I especially like is the personal board of directors to help guide you. And then Kevin, talking about uh, uh, demonstrating intellectual curiosity. You know, it's a, such a huge part of the learning curve. Uh, the more curious you are, the more new knowledge you'll seek out and the more wisdom you'll obtain. And then I like what you said about pursuing both formal and informal networks. You know, get out of your cube. <laughs> and then diversify your experiences. All of you said that, make yourself, will make you more valuable. Um, and it seems like all three of you have worked really, really hard to get you to your fantastic level of success. So thank you all so much. On behalf of LMU and the Finance Target <laughs> Affinity Council, thank you again for being a part of this panel. And then all the attendees, thanks for sharing your lunch hour with us. We obviously love alumni engagement and alums both engaging with the broader LMU community amongst other alums, and then also reaching back out to the current generation of students as they pursue their finance degrees. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Take care.